my dudes. Man, as you know, I've been drawing comic books for a long, long time. And uh, one of the guys that I got my start with is Matt Martin. And uh, he just kicked off this Indiegogo campaign with Ethan Van Skyver over on Indiegogo. And <laughs> it's a huge success. I thought, wow, what a great opportunity to have him come on over to uh, my channel and, and do a quick sit down. And so we just talk about comics and we talk about how we got our start and some of our process and a little bit of just how he created Snowman. So buckle up, this is about a 30 minute interview and uh, it's just such a pleasure to have my good friend Matt Martin join us here on my channel. So uh, let's dig into it. What, what was your first exposure to, to reading comics? When did you first fall in love with comics? Uh, I was in sixth grade. Um, it was the uh, Christmas gift exchange in our class and I got some Hot Wheels and the kid next to me got a couple of G.I. Joe comics and he wasn't into them and asked if I wanted to trade, but I was into G.I. Joe heavy at that time. So I thought it was cool because I was already drawing. I wasn't into comics, but I looked at them. I thought they were great. So I got them home. And after that, man, I just started like uh, every time I went to a drugstore or a grocery store, I was looking at the comic rack. It was a while before I found out about, you know, Spider-Man, Wolverine, that stuff. But it was G.I. Joe at first. Was that the uh, was that the G.I. Joe cover that you did a, a homage to? I don't think it was one of them. Oh, OK. Um, that came later. I think the first one, one of the books that was in that uh, that Christmas gift was the, uh, I'm not sure what number it was, but it had Lifeline hanging from his parachute upside down in a tree. And you could see down and it had those, uh, the Russian characters on the ground below him. Nice. You still have those? Great you still yeah, have those? Those Mike Zett covers, man, were awesome. They, they were so inspiring. So what led you into, what was your first exposure to the, like the, I guess you'd say the image guys, but I'm, you know who I'm talking about, right? Because they were like the leaders of the industry where you started. It wasn't so much about the comic as much as it was about kind of following the creators, right? At the, yeah, it became that after a while. I It's like I, I was saying the other day, um, I didn't want to draw comics until I saw McFarlane's artwork on Spider-Man. When I saw that, that cover uh, of Amazing Spider-Man 316. That's when I just, my mind was kind of blown at that point. And I just, I wanted to, I wanted to do that. And I did that for a while. I tried to copy McFarlane for a number of years. So what was your, <laughs> that brings us right into, I think a good segue into talking about Vortex. And like, was Vortex your first character that you had designed, that you had created? Yeah, he was. He went through a couple of different versions. He was called Crusader. Uh, he was called... Uh, couple of different different names saber i had it like a little logo i might have put that in the vortex collection i don't know if it was in there or not the the logo saber was like in the shape of a knife are you talking about the uh, the vortex pdf collection that you put up on gumroad yes yeah yeah there's a collection of logos in there oh cool so like it's got all the like behind the scenes like sketches and early uh early yeah. designs and just unpublished stuff, right? Stuff I did in middle school that we were talking about that you saw, yeah. Yeah, nice. Uh, yeah, so everybody out there should go and check that out. I mean, Vortex was the comic that, I mean, you could certainly see some McFarlane influence, and I, and I, I, I think uh, that's undeniable. But like, it, it had its own voice, its own, its own style, because you were, you were a heavy metal hardcore Christian at that time too. Yes, I was. Yes, and you got me. <laughs> uh, you I was hardcore, me. man. I wore those uh, Christian T-shirts to school all the time. Um, but uh, uh, so after, so Vortex was a highly, I guess you'd say almost, like there were a lot of Christian and religious overtones in, in Vortex. And so there was, there had to have been a moment where you were like, well, I want to do this other kind of story. And so can you talk a little bit about like, what made you decide? It's hard to give up your baby, like to stop doing something you've been doing for a while. You've been doing Vortex for like a few years, right? So it must have been hard for you to make that decision to go, okay, I'm going to put all of my energy into Snowman. Can you tell me a little bit about psychologically how you shifted gears to like, go, like what was the, the impetus, the decision-making factor that made you go, no, man, like Snowman is it. That's where I want to put all my energy. Well, that, that was a lot to do with you and, and Ethan. You know, he was working on Cyberfrog, which was a great property to begin with. And then you came up with Creed because you were trying to do the same thing I was. A Christian spawn for a while and you started doing your own thing. Deadbolt. Yeah. And it did so well, man. It was so creative. Creed. I, yeah, Creed. So 
create and then it i was sitting around still drawing the same old thing that i'd been trying to do for years and i, I was realizing that you know vortex really is just a christian spawn so you, you guys inspired me to come up with my own thing it took a while but uh and that the, how we came up with snowman is another story but you guys pushed me to come up with something more original. But I think that that's, and that's kind of the crux of what I, what I feel like was so essential for us growing up in the same high school and challenging each other. And now Ethan, to be clear, Ethan Van Skyver was not in our high school. He, he uh, kind of joined Hall of Heroes. He was the third guy, right? Uh, and he kind of joined in, well, technically like Cameron Enders did a, an issue of Hall of Heroes Presents, right? Yeah, and there was Bobby show. Burns, yep. and then there was, uh, uh, after Bobby Burns was Ethan, if I remember correctly, right? I don't know the timeline of, of Bobby. and uh, What was his book? Nadir. Nadir, yeah. I don't know when that was released. That was, the, that was All Heroes number three, I think. So right after Cameron. Yeah. So Ethan had joined, and he actually didn't even do a Hall of Heroes Presents. He jumped right into having his own book. Yeah, how'd you feel about that? <laughs> yeah, I know. Like it was, it was that rite of passage. I, we did it. Well, you didn't have to do it either. I had to. No, but everybody that came after was supposed to do that, right? Yeah, so like an introduction thing, see if it worked. Right, but I always kind of felt like I was the scraggler, like I was the guy who was just running to try to catch up. And so, like that's kind of the benefit. And this is this is kind of what I wanted to get at uh, is that I call you my rival because, like you and Ethan were always challenging me to want to do better, do better panels, do more intense camera angles, do more interesting scenarios with my characters. And I, I think that that allowed us to feed off of each other. And there, Ethan would come out and we'd all sit around your table in your kitchen and draw our own books. Do we do our, that's where we got like, maybe like five or six jam pieces where all three of us were drawing on it. And it was always, I, I, I never wanted to go first because I always wanted to come back in later and like touch it up a little bit more after I saw the way that, you know, because Ethan would do this insane detail, right? Yeah, he did. Uh, did you did you also feel that that sense of, I mean, from what you're telling me about Snowman, like you felt a little bit of that too, like really wanting to be the best version of your own thing, right? Oh, totally. And the competition thing between you and me flipped. You felt like you were trying to keep up with me for a long time. And I remember feeling like, man, I hope he doesn't get better than me. I always just wanted to be one step ahead of you. I was comfortable there, you know, <laughs> my ego. But but when you started doing Creed, I was playing catch up at that point. I felt like. Which is And I was I was coming behind you. I like the uh you were getting magazine articles about Creed and Snowman started doing that well, but it was after uh, it was after Creed. Yeah, what were the numbers on Snowman when it was at Hall of Heroes? Sure, I, I know the second issue was sixteen thousand. It ended up being the highest selling Hall of Heroes book. No kidding! Oh, dude, that's awesome. Snowman number two, yeah. Snowman number two sold better than Snowman number one. Yeah, it did. That's unheard of. In the nineties, it was always the second issue sells a little bit less. It was crazy. Yeah. But that success, you know, I've always attributed to you and Ethan, you know, because you guys brought all this attention to Hall of Heroes that we weren't getting before Creed and Cyber Frog. But what's crazy is like now all of that switched around because I'm looking at what you guys are doing now. Like, first of all, you know, big props to Ethan Van Skyver, right, for what he's done with Cyber Frog. Dude, I was I was so stoked when I found out he was doing Cyber Frog again. <laughs> I, you want to hear something crazy? I told him to crowdfund back in 2010. I told him you should you should do Cyber Frog again on uh, it was at the time it was Kickstarter, and he's like, "Nah, crowdfunding is like begging." For when money. was this? <laughs> 2010. He tells me crowdfunding <laughs> is like for begging for money. And I was like, no, man, you don't understand. And he's like, nah, I got a, I got a cozy gig. He was at DC at the time. And I think he was like landing, it was, he was doing really big books like Green Lantern. And I think he was doing Batman or something. And I was like, oh, okay, I get it. I get why you wouldn't want to risk that. Um, and then him and I were talking about me working on Blood Honey for a while. So I like, there's a cover that I did for Blood Honey back then. But anyway, it would have been, I was, I had been, when was that? That was around that time, 2010. Oh, way back then. Okay. 2009, 2010. And I think things worked out 
the best way possible. I, ironically, because I know Ethan went through some fire. He he went through some fire to get to where he is to go independent and go screw all this corporate stuff. Don't want to deal with corporate, you know, comic books anymore. Go in indie and crushed it. And he's got the personality for it. Like, you know, right. <laughs> he's a charming dude. And so uh, what I'm saying is, I'm intimidated by what you guys are doing now. So like, I'm feeling that pressure again. Like I haven't felt since high school. I'm intim- I'm intimidated by it. I got a lot to live up to, man. It's not necessarily one drawing. I mean, like, you can do good drawings, but together, put together a, a, a solid book like that. It's a lot of work, man. Yeah. And then to resist the temptation to go back in and keep reworking panels, right? Like, yeah, I do that all the time. <laughs> Because I, I, you know, I look at, I look at this book, you know, and, uh, you know, I look at that reflective, cr- well, you can't even see it. It's so That's shiny. Blinding. <laughs> so blinding. Just shield your eyes. Um, but you look at every panel from this and it's like, how could you not feel like, I mean, this is a seasoned pro really at performing at his absolute best. Right. When I would see him like, uh, doing green lantern or whatever book i would pick up he always had at least one page where he put in a bunch of silhouettes oh really yeah it looked like he was like you know just trying to catch up on the schedule a little bit sometimes hey man sometimes the silhouette is 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 a good directorial editorial choice okay yeah sometimes some shots are better you know as a like those old samurai movies when they're like standing on the bridge from the side view you know come on you know as an artistic choice I'm talk- I've heard Ethan talk about it. Oh, so, really? Yeah. Oh, so he, he admitted to yeah. calling that one. <laughs> and and all the all the artists that we looked up to did that, man. Dude, we I'm gonna kids. do I'm gonna do a whole book, all silhouettes. It's not even the whole have- book. Yeah, well, that shouldn't book. take long. <laughs> it's not it's gonna be the highest uh, crowdfunded book in history. <laughs> all silhouettes, no dialogue, all action, all silhouettes. We'll see how that goes. Bring it. <laughs> talk about raising the bar, right? Uh, no, but uh, should do real well, man. Should do real well. <laughs> my, my point, though, man, is that there's none of that in Cyber Frog. I think that's what you were saying is that every panel he yeah. uh, knocked it out of the park. It's one of the things I've been really enjoying is talking with my old comic book bros again about these stories. To me, comic books are like movies. Like, I don't know how you think of them, but I think of comic books like movies and it's like we're directing our own movies. So for me, it's a thrill when, you know, you and I we will just be playing GTA online or something and you'll be telling me a little bit about a scene that you're working on or, uh, you know, a sequence in your snowman book that you're working on. And it makes me think like, oh, man, I, I really got to be like trying to plot out a really cool scene to tell that about, you know what I mean? And I'm really enjoying that kind of uh, camaraderie of, of working on something that is like, like I said, it's like directors kind of talking about their, their films and these experiences that we're creating for our readers. And I know you've mentioned that you kind of think of your stories like films as well, right? Yeah. It's like a film with uh, with no budget. You can do whatever you want. I don't always take advantage of it though. Um, because by the time you get the main subject of, of a panel or, or a cover done, adding in extra stuff in the background just sort of uh, takes extra time and you're, you're always on a deadline. You always feel that pressure to get it done. So there's so much more I'd like to do with artwork, but it's just, you can't do it. You run out of time. Yeah. You know what? Uh, some of the, many of the comments are just like, you know, stoked for snowman, but now comes the hard part, the wait. That's the hard part. <laughs> the hard part for them is the waiting. But not for me, man. I'm... <laughs> yeah. There's some scenes in this book, speaking of budget, man, that I'm actually kind of scared of. I'm, I'm afraid to get to that point. You mentioned because I feel scenes. like I'm either gonna let myself down and not make it as as big as I picture it in my head, mm-hmm. or I'm gonna seriously take too long doing it. And you know what it's like, man. You you just wanna you want to be able to take, you know, two weeks to one a two page spread if you have the time. I can't really do that. So how many pages a week are you getting done on snowman? Uh, I'm doing better now. We're actually moving forward. I did the sample pages and I, you know, we weren't sure what we were doing. I was kind of waiting for Ethan to uh, figure out the plan 
it was kind of last minute with him. He was sort of because he, he had Rainbow Brute to put together as well. I mean, he's he's a busy guy, so I was kind of like, well, I don't know if we're doing Snowman, and I had to earn some money uh, in the past couple of months too. So I was I was kind of doing some other stuff, not going full time Snowman. But now you're full time Snowman. I got a couple of commissions to do, but yeah, full time Snowman. Other than that, stuff I've already committed to. Yeah, gotcha. And uh, but you're you're you spend a lot of time on every page, right? Can you talk a little bit about your process? I do. Painfully slow, man, because I agonize over everything, and it's everything's got to look right to me. If it doesn't, if a if a gun doesn't look like the gun it's supposed to, it's not acceptable to me. I know I'm totally different in that way. I know, and I, I'm kind of envious because you can draw like you drew the rifle on your snowman cover, and I was looking at it, I'm like, that's a perfectly awesome looking rifle, but it's it's a it's a cartoony looking version of a rifle, right? So you've got the freedom there to just make it look awesome. I don't like that without word. agonizing. What? Cartoony? Oh God! <laughs> Exaggerated, <laughs> maybe stylized. I can live with, but cartoony? How dare you, God. sir? I'm not going to talk for another ten years now. <laughs> no, it is cartoony, but uh, it's like uh, one of the things that I just like. I got so tired of working on things in AAA games that are that are just so meticulous about the details of things that I'm just like, you know what? If I'm going to do a comic, it's just going to be fun. Everything about it is just going to be fun. Every panel, every page. And I don't get as, as caught up in those details. Whereas like I, I can appreciate it and I can respect it because I like you're, you're, I think, aiming for a different type of storytelling. And for you, though, it's meticulous. And I, I don't know many people who are that meticulous because you'll like change a couple of lines and then you send me another version of it. And it's like you change these little you can't even tell what I did. Barely tell. <laughs> but for you, it's like, oh, the whole thing is different now. Uh, I've, I've never really uh, felt that way. I think for me, I, I'm well, looking at the whole uh, moment. And I noticed that I, I don't think that most people will pay attention to what kind of a rifle, but maybe your audience very much does. And maybe that's something that they'll, they really appreciate about your work that they might not like in, in my work, for instance it's the difference between like the way we used to draw buildings. I don't remember how you drew buildings in deadbolt, but back then I was trying to draw all the cities in perspective. I mean, that's how I work, right? Everything is on, in, in perspective, but then you just threw the, all of that out and started drawing buildings going whichever direction. <laughs> and it looks, it looks so cool, but you are no longer like constrained by like rules. Yeah. There was a, uh, can't remember the artist's name, but there was a guy that I met at a comic show, and uh, and he's like, "Yeah, I use a lot of rulers for for my work." And I was like, ah, "I hate rulers." And he's like, "Oh, you're gonna learn to love them." And I was like, "Oh, oh buddy." <laughs> that was one of those defining moments when I was like, "I'm not gonna do the traditional thing. I can't be Jim Lee." You know, to me, in my mind, I was like, "I, I can't afford art school back then." You know, this man like. There was one. There was one school that we talked about going to. Do you remember what it was? It was a Cooper. Joe Cooper school. school of Comic Book Design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forget the total name, the full name, but there was the ads in the back of comic books for it, right? Right. And uh, and then I just I talked to my parents about it, and they're like, "You can't afford that. You'll not. You'll never be able to go to college." You know. So I was just like, and that was when I was eighteen. So I was like, got to carve a different path. Do you know what I mean? And that was the, that was, yeah, that was the kind of like defiance. I think it's just defiance. It's absolute defiance. I don't like somebody telling me I can't do something. So going back to the ruler thing, do you never use any type of curve or straight edge for anything? Nah, dude, that's just, even, all, if even, you see a straight line, I did that freehand. Well, I'll, I'll, oh, no, I'll lay something true. down. I'll lay something down with a ruler and pencil, but then I don't, I don't always ink it with the ruler because it looks more natural if I try to ink it just freehand. But I'll lay down, I'll lay down lines, you know, to follow along when I'm inking. You know, uh, my feeling on rulers is it depends on the art style. Like, okay, so now I don't draw in just one art style. You know, like I've got to draw in the Overwatch art style and I gotta draw in these other games that I work on. It's like you gotta switch right. it all the damn time and you have to do it well. 
So I do whatever's necessary for the art style that I'm working in. Now, when I'm doing Creed, the only time I'm using a ruler is if it's for the frame of a, of a panel or if it's for uh, uh, action lines, you know. But even that, I'll usually do my action lines digitally, like a half tone. You can do those without a ruler, too. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So very, very little that I'm actually working with a ruler. I'm trying to think if there's any pages in this book that use a ruler. And I like it. I like to feel uh, organic and natural. And I've been trying to do more like uh, brushy, like kind of uh, sumie or, or like dry brush looking effects, you know, combined with a nice, clean, crisp edge on some other things. But I know right. you're meticulous about tiny little details. So I still have that pencil, by the way, that we got from that art, arts and crafts store in Mishawaka. Do you remember? It's like a 0 0.01. Is it red? Is it a red pencil? Yeah, I have that red one and I have the gray one as well. The gray one, the red one is the tiniest. That's a 0 0.03, I think, or something like that. I don't remember what size it was. I don't have mine. It was a Konor, right? Yeah, it was the Koinor. Yeah, I still got it. I'm gonna like stop the video just to like find this thing. Here we go. So I still have the gray one right here. Okay, that's, that's the same. Yeah. Just a different size is what it is, right? So are you are you totally fine with just spending like a whole week on one page if you needed it for that scene? As creatively, I'm fine with it. I gotta go faster than that now. But to turn snow, snowman around in a decent amount of time, I wanna be doing two pages a week. Like I said, man, there, there will be some pages where I want the whole week. Yeah. I packed so much in there and I kept going back and back and back, but it needed to be impressive. You know, it's a lot of, a lot of real yeah. estate for one picture. Yeah. Well, it's a payoff for, for the book too, right? It's like a big, important moment. Yeah. And those are important, right? You're, you're reading through story panel to panel, a lot of, a lot of dialogue, a lot of people talking and, and you sort of, you know, you want the whole story, but, creatively you know those those money shots are important you know, when you, when you turn that page and you see this like grand image that you can tell the artist took a long time to do it's a, it's a payoff what do you think speculatively is the limit on fold outs the limit yeah of... like i've seen the trifold cover has anybody done the quad fold cover or the quad oh, yeah. fold spread in the middle of the book? Has this been done? I think it's been done up to eight pages wide, I think. Really? I can't tell you who did it, but I think it's been done. Would it be possible to fold out and then fold vertically? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. For a real payoff shot that you spent you six months drawing. <laughs> I think it was Jim Lee, man, on some some book that he did, that he did an eight page wide shot. We're gonna have to research. That. It makes me think it was Jim Lee. If anybody in the chat knows, or if anybody in the comments knows, please put a link to that because I would love to find out what the record is. I think that we can. I think we can beat that. I don't want to do that, man. <laughs> You'd have to set up two tables, right? So you could just because I couldn't work on it one page at a time and then connect them. I'd have to see what's four pages over to work on this one. I got, here's what you do. Here's what you do. You get a projector, right? So you sketch it all out like on digital or, or on like a smaller piece of paper. And then you project that onto the larger thing. Have you ever seen Katsuya Tarada's artwork? I don't think so. He's this, he does this amazing, I've got it right here. I know I do. Yeah, look at this. I keep this one handy at all times. And this guy is super cool. Um, but his work, man, like he does these murals on the wall and they'll be like so intricately detailed. That's not a good example. Let me find a good one here. Yeah, that's only two pages wide, man. I know it's still like... only two pages wide, but uh, oh, you know what? He did this other book. Here we go. It's called Real Size. Let me make sure there's no nudity on this because he draws a lot of nudity. But um, he does these these images where you can kind of see it here, but he's drawing on. Can you see that? Like, that's a photo of him drawing on a wall. Yeah. So it's almost like a mural size thing. And then this book, and he's drawing it with like a Sharpie marker. And then this book. Oh, perfect. You can actually see him drawing on it there. Wow, that's insane. Yeah. 
So each page, each page is like a photograph of a wall. Yeah. Is, he does all of his art that big. Yeah. You know, look at this. He'll literally go out to a shop and he'll do that on their wall. That's cool. Yeah. So, uh, that guy is nuts and it's, it's very comic booky work and it's very intricately detailed. Very cool stuff. I can't imagine like doing something that you spend that much time, that much care on one piece. He'll sit there for like a whole weekend on one piece. I don't know, maybe even longer. I don't know. I never actually watched him do it, but I've seen one in person in Tokyo and I've seen one in person. Uh, fill up a wall in a weekend. He's fast. He does. Here's the thing. He doesn't pencil. Second guessing myself. I never got to the point where I could just ink, you know, without looking at it. I mean, Ethan blows my mind because he just like he'll scribble some blue lines and then he can see what it's supposed to be and he just starts thinking and, and it's right. He knows what he's doing. I always have to pencil it. You got to check out uh, Kim Jong Gi. Uh, he does the same thing, like kind of like Tarada. I think those those two are buddies. I think they tour. Oh, I know who that is right. He's 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 always just inking. He just goes straight to inks. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, yeah. he's on YouTube, right? Yeah, he's on YouTube now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I told Ethan I want to do a get together uh, reunion where we all sit around your table at your parents' house again, like the old days. You can work on Snowman, I'll work on Creed, and he can work on Cyber Frog, and we'll, we'll, we'll live stream it. No, I don't know. <laughs> I think that would be really fun, though, uh, just for old time's sake. And uh, we'll uh, kick back some Mountain Dew and some, eat some Taco Bell. and That'd be quite a thing, man. You live on the West Coast. He's on the East Coast. I'm in the middle. Yep. That's why it's got to be perfect. It's got to be. It's got to be at your parents' house, <laughs> just like the old days. I don't have to do anything. And Ethan has to get his luggage lost on the Greyhound bus again to really relive the experience. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, hopefully we'll see more of you over on his channel. So he's at uh, Comic Book. What is his his YouTube channel called? Comic Pro Secrets. Comic, Comic Artist Pro Secrets. Comic Artist Pro Secrets. Yeah. So. Uh, do you, I, I don't know if you what you guys have planned, but uh, hopefully we'll see more of you in future videos. You also have your own YouTube channel. I'll put a link in the description below so people can check that out. All right, man. And uh, Matt, it's good talking to you. We're gonna we're gonna play a little bit of GTA uh, next weekend. Sure. <laughs> we got that ca uh, Palico heist. Got, got a new DLC coming out. Yeah. Oh man, I'm so stoked. Uh, but dudes, everybody out there should go and uh, and back Snowman. A cold day in hell. Do you did you write yeah, that man. real quick? Did you write that video or did, did Ethan write that video? I, I wrote that. You wrote that. Yeah. Uh, can you write my video because I have no idea what to say and, and to pitch Creed. It takes a minute, right, to come up with something quick like that. Yeah, it takes a minute to write a little. Yeah. But he's he's the master at those uh, short little videos too. He's good at it, man. I'm, I'm learning from him every time I watch him. And uh, dude, I'm, and now I'm learning from you and, and how you're doing your book as well. And uh, I'm stoked to see you uh, meet with such a, a warm welcome from the community. The comic book community loves you. They love that uh, you're bringing Snowman back. I'm so excited for you genuinely. And I'm feeling that challenge, man. I got I to gotta up my, my game on my pages too because you're putting out your best work that you've ever done. I'm seeing what you're doing, man. It's magical to me magical i'm gonna put i'm gonna put that on the cover awesome. matt yeah Martin there you says go it's magical <laughs> that's my quote yeah all right matt thank you so much thanks for having me dude all right now get back to drawing pages because we need that snowman book all right, all right, all right. I'll talk to you later dude all right thanks man bye new from all caps comics snowman a cold day in hell the victim of a genocidal massacre has somehow returned from the dead and is carving a path of death across the heart of america Driven by the echoes of silent screams, this is the story of a man once known as Black Dog, the one now forever known as the Snowman. Snowman, a cold day in hell, back it today, only on Indiegogo. <laughs>